I'm Reverend Kristen Pettit Miller, the pastor at Peace United Church of Christ here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And we are recording worship again in our sanctuary where it is lonely without you. Our board will be meeting this Monday evening. We have a whole host of topics that we need to talk about, but one of them will be what we will do about when we return to worship. We know it's a difficult time to be apart from each other. I wanted to make you aware of one more thing, and that's that if you would like to still be part of our race study with Faith United Methodist Church that is online on Wednesday evenings at 7.30, it's not too late to be a part of that. We are discussing the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. You are very welcome. You can contact me at the church, and we can send you the Zoom link for those important meetings. Today in worship, we will be hearing some music from Lori Krause. We will be having Bev Hunt share some of her story and read scripture for us. We will be listening to music from Dennis Bowman, and we will be invited into a benediction that is a new benediction for us with images of water. And now, as we enter this time of worship, we hold in prayer the mass shooting that happened in our nation again. At the time of filming this, two people have died in Collierville, Tennessee. And we have candles on our worship table remembering those two lives. Let us enter into a time of worship together. Will you pray with me? Holy God, be present with us wherever we are. Settle in with us in this time where we praise you. Gather us in that we may focus our attention on what you would have us do to live as disciples in this world and go with us afterward that we may live into our faith. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is from St. Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. And I'm reading from the Braille King James Version of the Bible. 
And they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried with more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith had made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Thus ends the scripture for today. In my first year of divinity school at Bethany Theological Seminary, I took my first class in the New Testament. I proudly came to my class that day with my newly purchased Oxford annotated Bible. I was ready to learn all I could about this section of the Bible which has guided our Christian faith. I was anxious to soak in all the knowledge I could about the stories of Jesus. I was hungry to figure out why some of the gospel stories were different from other gospel stories. And on that first day of the second semester of seminary, our professor said, the first thing you need to remember is that each one of you bring something to the scripture, depending on how you read it. And I remember feeling a little bit as if that were blasphemy. I remember feeling as if maybe I were being duped. I remember wondering if perhaps this professor had a little something more than coffee in his mug that morning. But then he went on to explain that wholly apart from whatever biblical criticism a scholar can do, and sometimes that means analyzing the history of scripture, of where it was written and when it was written, or looking at a literary style, if it's a letter or a story or poem, or whether it's a, a criticism based on the type of language, the common Greek, a different form of Greek, or Aramaic, we still also have to take into account that every single person that encounters each text brings something of themselves into that reading. We read our scriptures when we are people of faith as people who have our own life circumstances, who have each traveled different journeys in our lives, who have grown in new ways, who carry our own biases and perspectives. It's just part of being human. And so this morning, as I was thinking about our scripture, I wanted to offer you two different ways of looking at the same scripture through two different sets of perspectives. The first is a perspective written by the homiletics professor Barbara Brown Taylor. I love Barbara Brown Taylor's exegetical work. She writes this in her book, Mixed Blessings. And whenever I want to make a story come to life, I always look at the way that she sees the scripture. I find that it helps me to understand a little bit more about how the scripture can be deepened. So I wanna share with you what Barbara Brown Taylor writes about today's word. She says, for the sake of the story, let's say you are a disciple, any disciple, waking up in Jericho with a knot in your stomach. 
you did not sleep well. All 13 of you were bedded down on the same rough pallet, and the fellow to your right turned over every 30 minutes all night long. He knows that you know that Jerusalem is just 15 minutes down the road. And unless you are waylaid, you will be there by dark. You're not sure what will happen there, but from what Jesus has said, it sounds grim. Now that you understand half of what he says, it's harder than you thought, this disciple business. When Jesus first asked you to follow him, you thought you were headed for success, for high political office at first, and then, if he is who you think he is, for the very throne of Israel. But lately, he has been talking crazy, talking about dying and rising and being a servant. It is not what you expected. And you had thought more than once about turning around and going home. But you love him and the way he seems to love everyone he meets, never seeing just crowds, but always people, and reaching out to touch them and to heal them and to make them whole. And then Barbara Brown Taylor continues, it's not long before Jesus is at it again. On your way out of Jerusalem with half the town tagging along behind you, you see a blind beggar by the side of the road rocking back and forth on his heels. Someone groans and says, it's Bartimaeus again, by which you gather that he is well known, at least by those who support him with their alms. Not to worry, you're thinking, the poor are with us already when suddenly Bartimaeus' head jerks up and he shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Several of the disciples, you included, stop dead in your tracks and look at one another. It is the first time anyone but a demon or a disciple has called Jesus by the title son of David. How in the world did that blind beggar recognize what no one else had seen? That the man on the road in front of them is indeed the Messiah. But your puzzlement is cut short by the shushing of the road. Be quiet, beggar, someone hisses. Don't be shameless, Bartimaeus, hustling a rabbi for change. Somebody tell him to shut up. But Bartimaeus will not shut up. Son of David, he cries again, have mercy on me. And Jesus hears him this time and stops. Call him, he says. And the crowd changes its mind about Bartimaeus, scolding him no longer, but congratulating him instead, encouraging him to his feet. Take heart, someone says. Get up, Bartimaeus, he's calling you. Today must be your lucky day. But Bartimaeus does not merely rise. He flings off his dark cloak and he springs to his feet, rushing toward the remembered sound of Jesus' voice. He misjudges by a foot or so and he plants himself in front of you. His big round eyes rolling in their separate orbits, a look of great expectation on his sunburned face. Someone takes him by the shoulders, a friend of his, and turns him slightly until he is facing Jesus. He is nodding, nodding his thanks when Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Now there is a rhetorical question if you ever heard one, right? What does Jesus think he wants? Thinks he wants a pair of sunglasses? No, you know better than that. Bartimaeus is not playing to the crowds. He just wants to hear Bartimaeus say it. 
He wants to hear exactly what it is that Bartimaeus wants. And Jesus wants to hear how much Bartimaeus believes. So the blind man summons up his heart's desire in six words. My teacher, he says, let me see again. And Jesus replies, go, your faith has made you well. Just like that, just words, no mud, no spittle, not even a touch, still and all. It is enough. Bartimaeus closes his eyes, and when he opens them again, they work. Go, Jesus tells him, but he does not go, or else he decides on the spot that his way is Jesus's way, because that is the way that he chooses, without any way of knowing where it will lead. Still blinking, he chooses the road to Jerusalem, in the company of the Lord. That's the way that Barbara Brown Taylor tells the story, at least. I was thinking about that version as I was working on the sermon, because as I said, I love the way that she tells the story. I think that she makes stories jump off the page. And for so many years, that way of looking at the story of Bartimaeus has been my template. It's the way that I read it. It's the way that I see it. I'm a white, middle-class woman with a seminary degree and 20-plus years in pastoral ministry. I read it, and I see it the way she does. I see Bartimaeus rising from the mat. I listen to the words that Jesus asks him. What do you want me to do for you? And I think... Here it is. This is a miracle. Physical healing is incredible. Hallelujah. And now let's wrap this up so we can all go some, eat some donuts in the fellowship hall. That's the way I have always seen it. But three or four years ago, I stopped reading the scripture in this same way, with this same passage. And let me tell you why that changed. You see, it was three or four years ago that I met my friend and parishioner, Beverly Hunt. Beverly and her husband, Mike, came to Peace United Church of Christ and embraced us just as enthusiastically as we embraced them. Bev started singing in the choir. She started coming to our fifth Tuesday ladies' dinners. And she started attending our adult Sunday school. And before long, oh, wait, I should tell you one more thing about Bev before I carry on. What you may need to know about Bev if you haven't met her is that Bev is blind. You see, Bev was born three months early in the days before post -world, in the days post-World War II when doctors didn't know quite as much as they know now about premature infants. And so it was actually the oxygen in the incubator that kept tiny Bev's body alive all those years ago. The oxygen that saved her life, which also affected her eyesight. Something that modern medicine is now so very aware of and can correct. Bev has memories of some lights and shadowy figures, but at the age of 12, everything was gone. She's never seen a sunset or a sunrise. She hasn't seen mountains or oceans. She doesn't know what her husband's face looks like. And after I met Bev and got to know her, I began to wonder what she thought about this story of Bartimaeus. And so this week, I sat down and asked her. Uh, I think Bartimaeus first came to me in uh, probably younger than junior high school at church, at Faith United 
uh, Methodist Church, and um, they asked me to read it for the class. Um, my parents didn't really stress the blindness like a lot of um, uh, social workers teach uh, families not to overemphasize, you know, the blindness, just kind of integrate into the society. So mom and dad didn't really, you know, think that I had to know that story. And I'm glad uh, because, you know, you're envious. Well, you know, why didn't I get my side? So uh, I uh, always enjoyed reading it to classes, the church, uh, children younger than me, and then the Sunday school teacher would uh, ask me to talk about it. He wasn't really sure that Jesus heard him, and he shouted it louder the second time. You, you, you know, I want you to hear me. And uh, yes, uh, because I can't, I can't get someone's eye to get their attention. And I don't know when it's proper to, you know, come over here and, you know, I need you to help me with something. And so, yes, voice is very important to a, a person without sight. Uh, you know, use your voice to get their attention or whatever you need it for at the time, you know. So, yeah, it's very important to um, connect with him that way. I, I, I really, he, I was so excited, you know, to get maybe some attention from Jesus. He jumped right up and took his cloak off and ran over there, and they helped him. His friends cared for him, or they wouldn't have told him, go ahead and ask now. He's listening. You know, you, you can repeat. So he repeated it again, and they said, you know, be of good cheer, be of good comfort, because uh, he, he, he wants to help you. And, boy, he jumped right up, and that's what I would have done. Blindness allows people to show compassion. It allows people to be kind, it uh, allows people to share uh, what they can do to help your life. And then I try to appreciate <clears throat> the kindnesses that are shown to us or me. The writer Anai Nin once said, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. Here, all along, I was reading this scripture and thinking that the focus was on making sure that the blind man was healed. And here, Bev considered what it took for Bartimaeus to be surrounded by friends, friends who would bring him face to face with Jesus. Well, all along, I thought the miracle was the point of the story, the miracle of Bartimaeus not being blind. And Bev recognized that the miracle is one of putting our faith in the hands of Jesus, regardless of whatever peril or turmoil we live in. While I open my now aged and tattered red Oxford annotated Bible, which is about this thick, Bev's finger, fingers graze a volume of one of 18 Braille books that take up a whole shelf on her wall. My friend Bev and I read this scripture differently. And there is tremendous beauty for me in that. The beauty in the gospel is that we can always come to it new and fresh. And the truth is that in reading it and sharing our stories, our personal stories and our personal perspectives on scripture, we are led even closer and closer into knowing the truth of God's love a truth that shows up in community just as it shows up in the, in the biblical stories. Thanks be to God for giving us different ways of understanding. Amen.
I invite you now to quiet your breathing, to maybe close your eyes, and to enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, touch us with love, with love that is life-giving. Quiet our anger just a little bit, gentle our desperation, soften our fears some. Soothe the knots of our cynicism. Wipe away the tears from our eyes. Ease the pain in our body and soul. And reconcile us. Help us to look at the people and the world around us. To remember to take away our feelings of anger and violence. To remind us to care compassionately for all who come across our way. Come, Lord Jesus, expand us by your power, life generating as the sea. Invite us to use the power that you have given us to do things that we believe in. And to be something of who you call us to be. Inspire us to dream more. To sweat and to sing. To fail and to laugh. To link our passion with courage. Our hope with discipline and our love with persistence. Come, Lord Jesus, startle us with your presence as life-sustaining as air. Open our hearts to praise you. Open our minds to attend you. Open our spirits to worship you. In the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Go out into this world, out into your day-to-day -day lives, knowing that God reaches for you, that Jesus asks how you can be healed. Go in peace with the love of your community until we meet again.